Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation today. I'm honored to be here. And um, it was very interesting coming to the conference. I've been doing humanities for a while, studying it, but the, I felt like I was going to be out of place today. But listening to the presentations, I realize I'm actually at home. This is pretty, pretty amazing. So let me start off with um, setting, a, setting the, the stage, where if we think about it, like never before in humankind, we're losing vast bodies of culinary wisdom from the past and as it's being created. It's not just looking backwards, but we're constantly reinventing ourselves. And I believe that all the using algorithms and mining big data is useful and part of it that isn't going to solve the problem. And now, as we heard earlier this morning, I think with the technology of where it's gotten to, we can start capturing it as it's happening simultaneously as looking back and merge those two. And I'll explain how I, what I mean by that. So uh, you did thank you for the introduction on it. But my, my work over the past few decades um, like, is about smart heritage. This morning, Natalia talked about from Singapore about smart heritage, and that really resonated with me. I'm spending time at a house in Malaysia. I've been in that region for years, so that was fascinating. Vivek talked about democratizing and fairly paying those that do the research, and it's something obvious that I believe in, I've been participating, but I have some ideas I'd like to share with you to make that better together. Uh, then we talked, and the audience talked about reducing discrimination or bias. I mean, let's just be candid. I'm a white male that speaks English. The privilege I have is unparalleled, and I've always tried to be better about it, but I think through technology, we can globally make this better for people doing cultural research. And then Marcus unveiled the reality of the publishing industry. I've been in publishing, published my, my first book myself, done TV, but I just start, I've only done one peer-reviewed paper, and I didn't realize behind what was happening behind the scenes, so that was fascinating. And then Catherine talked about sustainability, where I have this as a non-technical person at some level, creating a system thinking it's going to be fine, and then realizing the technical debt that comes in building on older systems, and then thinking, oh, it's going to be there forever. Well, is it? And that really hit me, that hit me hard. So um, let's get into, see, my approach to understanding the cultures of Southeast Asia primarily, my work focuses on Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore. Even though that's a vast area, that's where I've spent the time on it. And to me, capturing data, there's only four types of media, right? Text, audio, photo, and video, which is just a combination. And for years, this is what I've used, but manually, as we've all done, started with a the camera, then and all the way as we moved up to that. And then I've taken that data, I think, and absorbed so much that it became information. And I started to really build a knowledge base that I used in writing, in teaching, in publishing as we moved up this ladder. And then with the communal intelligence, the conversations, the publishing, um, we got some insights. And at this point, hopefully, I have some wisdom. But I think I've added these arrows to this diagram because I believe often we start at the bottom, especially when we're doing research. We're looking at the data and we move up. Where my approach, my, my mission in life, is to actually start at the top, interacting with people that have knowledge, and then decoding it working backwards. And technology, I believe, can help us go both directions, frankly, and I'll explain how that might happen. Now, my journey in formalizing, and what I realize now are kind of data sets. I'm teaching at the CIA, Culinary Institute of America, and um, we had it in 46 before they did in 47, regardless. So with that, though, students would ask, well, what's Thai food? And usually the answer is, well, coconut milk, lemongrass. It's like, that's a list of ingredients that lacks the respect necessary for thousands of years of food history. So I came up with a basic model to explain this in class and take them through that journey with photos and videos and show them the context because you think about it. As you can see, it's where you are begins. And this was my basic model of it. And then an example on the right, I believe, is Thailand, or I can't see from here. Um, yeah, Thailand. And this is the way I'd illustrate it, but still. It's oversimplified, but it's a good diagram. It's a good illustration for teaching, but it certainly wasn't a, data, a database or a model. 
And then tum yum soup, some of you may have had before, the hot and sour soup. So what's unique about it? Because all recipes, ingredients, technique, presentation. Change one of them, it changes the rest. Same in, all of you eat, some of you cook, so I'm sure you understand this. So that's pretty straightforward. And then I started using mind mapping and saying, okay, well, what is tum yum? For all the tum yum I've eaten, all the teachers I've worked with, laying out books, this is how I wrote my first book, laying out people that were respected and vetted publications, and looking through and go, oh, every single recipe has this, this, and this, some have that, and then here's variations. And I started tracing this journey of traditional foods from the streets, homes, restaurants, into retail shelves and consumer product goods or frozen dumplings at the store. Like, how do you represent that flavor experience in a bite? And it's not so simple. So this was mind mapping where, okay, it got me a little further down the road. I started to understand a little bit more about context. Because to me, context is everything. Your flavor, what you like to eat, it's completely a subjective experience. That concept of best restaurant is nonsensical. I mean, who, who's the arbiter of what's best? It's your opinion, and it's, it's in context. So in 2015, a colleague, and, my, a colleague and, my, and myself were doing this research project, and I was, I was presenting at a conference, the Research Chefs Association, and every year I talk about cuisine. Well, this year she's like, well, you do research different. When you take people on these tours, you do it differently. And so we took them through this case study of Boko, this Vietnamese dish, how it was translated, and so on. And that little slide on the bottom hit me. A couple of months later, I'm like, why isn't there an app to do this? Why isn't there a way to capture data in the field with the supercomputers we already have in our hands with structure? And so chefs are, I don't know, kind of crazy at times. So I said, well, let me build it. So I hired an engineer for three and a half years and built it, like from scratch. And well, he had some base and we worked on it and invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, non-funded, I, I completely understand that. And we actually did it. And then I realized it wasn't the right partner. So next chapter. So then I'm at a conference up at that MIT and the CI were hosting together called Rethink Food. And Rethink Food, I met uh, Dr. Matthew Lang, who blew my mind. Of, he was explaining what they were doing at IC Foods. At that point, it was based at Davis. He spun that out since then. And when he talked about the Internet of Food, it sounded cool. But then when he said this word ontology, like ontology, what's that? And I look it up, I'm like, well, the matter, well, there's so many definitions to most words, right? But the way that he used it, which to me was like, oh, that's, that's the key. That's what I need to really explain. It wasn't just words and definitions, like a lexicon. That's what we do, right? We have our discipline here, the vocabulary we're using. I'm just, I just started my master's a couple months ago. So I'm, I don't speak like a lot of you yet. Uh, I'll get there. So, but I've always had a lexicon with my friends, with my family, and with my colleagues. And we can talk efficiently. We can communicate complex subjects and understand each other. But when he talked about contextual relationships and you think about that mind mapping, I'm like, oh, that's the next step. That's how I'm going to get to the next level of my research. So we started to collaborate. And I took that old model and we started to the right and going, oh, this is all in context of culture. It wraps it. And when I said um, geography, he's like, actually, place might be a better way to look at that because it's not a map. It's a sense of place, and there's a lot more to it. When I talk about history, it's like, well, is it time, past, present, and future? I'm like, oh, like, it just changed the way I thought of things. And so we started working together on some projects, and we wrote this one paper about digitizing recipes. And it reminds me, I was doing my, match, my undergraduate, and I wanted to write. So my teacher challenged me and said, well, then, if you want to write, who do you want to write for? Oh, I want to write for Gourmet. And this goes, well, fine, then do the work. Do a market analysis, critical analysis of each one. How are they structured? What's their voice? And so I did that. So he challenged me in a similar way as an academic at that point, teaching at UC Davis, saying, well, what are the schemas that organize data out there for recipes? Because the recipes are the foundation of so much. 
And one thing when I went through Google and BBC and schema.org, every one of them, I know that's only three, were missing culture, the cultural context of that recipe. I'm like, well, that's a huge gap. That's my place. That's what I do. How can I get into this a little bit more? So I started taking the tum yum soup and understanding, like, instead of ingredients presentation technique, to develop flavor from ingredients is a complex web of interactions. If you think about it, recipes are algorithms. This goes to this, which means this to here. If you have that, and it's like, oh. So I started building recipes and decoding them um, in that way. So then uh, Dr. Lang introduces me to an organization, Food On, um, and with Food On, it taught, they, taught, they, are, they are building, there's the most common um, ontology of food from what a food product is, and you see cultures off in this area. Uh, Damien Dooley's uh, leading this organization. There's a lot of people involved, of course. And uh, so ontology, and starting to look at it like this, I'm like, oh, this is how I can explain these complex situations. Uh, and it could be, you look at an apple, well, how does an apple transform into this? And what's its form? And where does it come from? Because these little nuances is, are what make food culturally unique. The ingredients, where they came from. Oh, just, just use butter. <laughs> really? Now, sometimes it doesn't matter. My wife, way better cook than I am, but doesn't think of, she just cooks. And I'm super analytical as being an R&D chef for the last 20 years, but she can still cook better. So you don't need to calculate, you don't need to analyze to create delicious food. Frankly, more than 50% of my best meals in my life are from cooks, not chefs. Cooks know how, chefs know often why, and it's a business. I mean, that's what you do, it's a business. So, um, and what they're doing, building these ontologies, food on, is just one piece of this ecosystem, and everyone here that search for a recipe relies on this technology. Otherwise, you can't ask questions in the basic Boolean language and say this and that, but I don't want this, it's this food. It's like, oh. So, where are we now as we're moving through this? So, a few years ago, I had this idea of, well, let me rebuild this platform, but bigger. So I came up with a concept called Flavor 360, partnered with someone, and we built it from scratch again. But this time, one thing that we did a little different is what I like to call knowledge templates. We've already codified internally. If you think about it, everyone on the planet grows, makes, buys, or sells an ingredient, a component, or a build, which is a recipe of things. That's how the system works. We can get into the whole food system. But, um, so we started developing templates. Well, if I'm out in the market and I'm looking at an ingredient and it's produce and it's a green leafy vegetable, what do I wanna know about it? And so we started building this system where you can go out and capture it, you never had to download it, it worked offline, all the things a lot of people were talking about today. That was in 2020. So, one of the projects that we did, my, one of my passions is fermented foods. No, no surprise if you think about the cuisines of Asia, a lot of fermented foods in that region. So we were studying fermented bean paste. And so we took a mo the app, we put some templates in it, we used just citizens, and we built in the knowledge and the guidance into the template for them to ask questions in the marketplace and capture videos and photos. And then we had the data and we looked at it. Really, my goal is to quantify qualitative research. It's not one or the other, it's a little bit of both. And so then you can do interactive flavor wheels, you can dive into it, because if it's in a structured database, you can ask questions of it. We didn't even get to natural language processing and all the things you can do, but just having a database of your stuff organized makes a big difference. And we're able to do videos, et cetera, um, mind maps and other visualizations. So let me show you one short minute, three minute video that was produced 100% offline by people capturing it that weren't food researchers, that we just guided them through app and said, ask these questions, take photos of this. And then because it was organized, we just did a basic video editing. So check this out. Oh, audio. Did you realize that by fermenting soybeans, 
you can change not only their taste to create and release active umami compounds, but the process can also transform the bean's color, aroma, texture, and overall flavor profile. Truly, soybeans are the source of hundreds, if not thousands, of indispensable food products and components. Three generations, same family. This protein powerhouse begins the transformation into soybean paste in Shandong, a coastal province in northeastern China, as resident artisans, chefs, and home cooks have been doing for more than 6,000 years. It's fascinating to consider that this is the origin of all soybean paste, like Japanese miso or Korean donjang. Once the dried soybeans are soaked and cooked, they can take two different paths on their flavorful journey. They can become these dark beans after nearly a year of closed fermentation. Yet another fermentation process only takes a few months to turn into this deep brown paste. First, let's see how the brown soybean paste is made. 看到没有, after these soybeans have fermented for a few months, the soybean paste, sometimes called ground bean sauce, can be mashed and used in simmer dishes. It can also be added directly into countless recipes. Here are a few that rely on this umami building block of flavor, including stir fries and braised dishes. A different and longer fermentation process yields these dark black soybeans. The dark color is created by the Maillard reaction. Made into a simple paste or used whole, we found these being used in Chengdu, Sichuan province as part of a stir-fried green bean dish, in a double-cooked pork, and they're also an important flavor element in the iconic Ma Po Tofu Red Hot dish. Thanks for having a taste. So. That's just by citizens capturing content of that quality that we could get off of our phones. So I had another video, but I'm going to move just so I'm on time. And out of that, out of one of the researchers, she happened to be an artist. I saw her work. She, she took the data that we found in the field and transformed it into actual visual art as well. So we were able to take this content and create many different forms of visualization, some for entertainment, some for education, and some for scientific research to understand what's happening. So here's another example. Sometimes you don't know what you're going to find, and that's what I'm learning. Don't go to find something. Go discover. And that's, that's a new perspective for me. So with this video, you can see sometimes the ingredient, the component, tells you what to do with it how you would use it. And so it goes through, and I'm going to shorten this so we can have some more Q&A. And with this, they say, with this color, you use it this way. With this color, you'd use it this way. If it's fermented for this many years, you use it in Mapo Tofu. So as a chef that's creating food, and you see it all over the country, understanding how it was done in context of the original, original source Instead of just creating stuff and mixing, there's nothing wrong with a, you know, a mapo tofu mayonnaise, fine. But first understand where it came from and what they do there. So um, what's next, right? We got to this point and I'm like, okay, well, where am I going next? Just last week, I found this paper as I was getting ready for this and I've heard of knowledge graph and I'm like, oh, we go from ontology. Because to me, instead of us creating the template, to me, use the software to go out and crowdsource the knowledge, then create the knowledge graph that you do these templates based on, and then push that back out into the field and get people to go through it using conditional logic to help populate, curate, and validate what you think that model is. So it's this ongoing cycle of improving the data model, and at the same time, within a nonprofit, 
right? Or some way it's protected to protect that content so it's not just out in social media getting owned by other folks. Um, you have much more technical people here, but to me, looking at this, um, and I can share this paper with you, as you go from unstructured data all the way to the end, this is how things work on the internet, and I think there's some possibilities. Lastly, in my reading, um, I discovered, I, I never heard of QCA in the analysis, fuzzy set analysis, and I came across Charles Reagan and this podcast, and I've listened to the podcast 10 times in the last month, it's only 24 minutes, and it's incredible to think, if we have the structured data of ingredients, components, build, cultural context, temper, everything, to be able to analyze food culture using QCA, if anyone knows of it, please let me know. I'm interested to collaborate. And um, I've been mapping what this digital heritage network would look like, but I need folks like you, and this is why I'm coming back into academia. And um, I want to rebuild this platform at, that's open source and um, so on. So that is kind of what I went through. I have another. 25 slides that I hid in the last four hours because I wanted to have some conversation. So I guess I'll leave it up to you to moderate that.